Thank you for your singing. Please remain standing for our scripture passage. Book of John, chapter 10. We'll begin in verse 15 through verse 21. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon, and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This ends the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you for the blessing of Christ and what he has done for us. We thank you that our good shepherd has laid down his life to take it up again. We thank you for the hope of resurrection that we share. Lord, we pray now that as your word is preached, that you would do what only you can to open up eyes, ears, hearts, and minds, that all who hear would receive your word for what it is, the word of God, not the word of man. We pray that you would be moving and that you would be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're picking up again with our series in John, and for those of you who aren't familiar, our usual practice here is to simply take a book of the Bible and preach straight through, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, trusting, as we saw last week, that Christ's sheep will listen to his voice. Uh, so I'd invite you to keep your Bibles open uh, to John chapter 10, and we are going to just pick up where we left off last week, uh, John chapter 10. Verse 16, I wanted to begin by continuing to apply uh, the last part of the verse. Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now we saw last week how this applies to missions and evangelism. Christ has his sheep. He has those who are his, who have been given to him by the Father, who have not yet been called. Right? I have other sheep. I must bring them also. He is committed to seeing them brought in. Uh, but where we'll begin this morning is by considering some of the implications of the last section of this verse. So look with me to the text and notice Christ's goal. He says he is committed to bringing in his other sheep, and the result will be that there will be one flock under one shepherd. Now, Christ, of course, is not talking about literal sheep, but rather his people, his elect, his chosen, those whom the Father has given to him, John 10, 29. Christ says that his people, all of his sheep, will be one. They will be one flock. Now, remember again, Christ has purchased a people from every tribe, nation, tongue, language. Revelation 7, verse 9. And he says here in John 10, 16, that he will bring them, they will listen to his voice, and they shall be one flock under one shepherd. Now in his high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus prays not only for his disciples, but for all those who would believe through his message. Uh, and that means, therefore, all Christians across the whole world. And look at what he prays here. Uh, John 17, 20 to 21, Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, uh, not only his disciples, uh, but for all those who will believe through their word. And what does he pray? That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe you have sent me. So what is Jesus' prayer to the Father in that section of John 17? He prays that all of his sheep, all those the Father has given him, all who will believe through the preaching, the message of his disciples, that they would be one. That there would be unity amongst them. 
And the example of the kind of unity that he's after is the kind of unity that is displayed between the Father and the Son. And he goes on to say that our unity would actually be what testifies to the world that the Father had sent him. Now here's the implication <laughs> to understate it. Unity in Christ's church is a big deal. And we see not just in the local church, but the universal church. Now, before we go any further on this topic, I want to address a common pitfall. There are some groups who are really, really big on unity, who will talk a lot about how we all ought to be unified, but then they will declare what stands in the way of unity is this pesky thing called doctrine. Right? Doctrine divides, they will say. What we need is to lay all that doctrine, all those teachings, all those things we believe aside and focus on our unity. But here's the problem. Unity that comes at the cost of truth is not Christian unity. So we must be clear on what it is that truly unites us. We must have gospel unity. We must have Christian unity. Unity, And we cannot have Christian unity with those who would deny core doctrines of Christianity, core doctrines of the faith, right? So if you deny that Jesus rose from the dead, whatever you might like to call yourself, you're not a Christian. So we cannot have Christian unity with somebody who is not a Christian. Now, we believe doctrine to be vitally important, and that is because we believe that everything God has revealed to us matters. So please don't misunderstand me as I, as I emphasize and talk here about unity. We are not talking about sacrificing truth on the altar of unity. Rather, as Christ says, we are looking at the attitude that we must have towards Christ's other true sheep. Right? Those who are his sheep. So we are simply trying to apply doctrine. We're not setting doctrine aside. We are applying doctrine, looking at how John 10, 16 impacts how we as Christians must relate to other Christians, how we must relate to Christ's other sheep. So real Christians who believe the true gospel, who have truly been born again and are committed to living for Christ, Jesus says, he prays, in fact, that we would be one. He declares we are one, one flock under one shepherd. How then shall we live? How then shall we treat one another? Especially in light of our differences. Well, we must recognize that what binds true believers together is far more significant than anything that might divide us. Consider what you, Christian, what you have in common with every other true believer. Firstly, you are equal in value and dignity as you are both made in God's image. You are descended from the same first parents and are both guilty through the same original sin. You and they stood equally condemned before God. Guilty in Adam, guilty from your own sins, and equally helpless, hopeless, alienated from God, and unable to do anything to save yourselves. You then were both saved in the same way. You were forgiven through the same finished work, cleansed by the same blood, interceded for by the same mediator, credited and clothed with the same righteousness, indwelt by the same spirit, united to the same Christ, members of the same body, under the same shepherd, and brought into the same flock. You are children of the same God, brothers and sisters. In Christ. See how this ought to bring us together. Salvation is union with Christ. That is, it is being joined to Christ. So follow this. If I'm united to Christ and you're united to Christ, see where that brings us. 
that brings us together. We are brought close together, members of one body, members of one family, living stones in the same spiritual building. So it doesn't matter what they look like, what language they speak, what their ethnic heritage may be. It doesn't matter how weird you think their food is or how different are the songs they would sing in the car. It doesn't matter what people who look like them have done to people who look like you. And it doesn't matter what people who look like you have done to people who look like them. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 verse 28. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Consider as well that if anyone is a true Christian, a true believer, you will spend eternity with them. They will be a co-heir with you. The day will come when both you and they will be perfectly sinless and you may encounter one another in glory. So make it your goal to live in such a way so that you would have as little as possible to apologize to them for when you see them in heaven. For if you will spend eternity worshiping with them, if you will one day experience perfect fellowship and friendship with them beyond any relationships on earth, then what a shame it would be that we could not have any fellowship here and now. And so this all means that we must have an attitude of true charity toward those who are true Christians. Now, despite our differences on secondary matters, not to downplay these secondary matters, but despite these differences on secondary matters, if they are true Christians, then we know they have the core things right. And so we can and should be able to enjoy real Christian fellowship with them. And this is why our church has taken the approach to membership that we have. We have aimed to keep our membership statement of faith simple, focusing it on the core doctrines, the things that should unite all true Christians. Uh, Our conviction is that even if we have some differences on secondary doctrines, If you are a true Christian, you should be welcome to be a member of our church. We believe the door to membership in the local church should be roughly the same size and shape, as much as we can make it, as the door to membership in the universal church. So just, we need to understand that our behaviors are going to be downstream from our beliefs and assumptions. Another way to say that is that orthopraxy, right practice, flows out from orthodoxy, right doctrine, right teaching. So here we have some of these foundations for how we must interact with other Christians. The blood of Christ transcends the boundaries that people typically like to draw. We notice that Christ divides humanity along different lines than we typically would. And so we must labor to view things as he does. We must love what Christ loves. We must view ourselves and others as Christ does. Christ has purchased a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he says there is one flock, one shepherd. So may we do our part to hold out the right hand of fellowship to those who are true brothers and sisters in the faith, regardless of our differences. Let's continue on in the text, looking at verse 17. Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So Jesus here points to his obedience as the reason that the Father loves him as he does. Now, 
I think we shouldn't take this as if the father did not love the son before he came down uh, and embarked on this mission to bring salvation. Again, the, uh, what we've already seen in John is that the son has eternally been with the father, John 1, 1 to 5. Jesus will speak of returning to the glory that he had with the father before the world began, John 17, verse 5. So I think it's pretty safe to say that the Father would not have dwelt in glory with the Son from eternity past if he had not been pleased with the Son, if he had not loved the Son. So it is not that the Father began to love the Son at this point because of his obedience, but rather, as D.A. Carson puts it, the love of the Father for the Son is eternally linked with the unqualified obedience of the Son to the Father. Close quote. I think another way to say that is that the Father loves the Son for who he is. And he is the perfectly obedient Son. So what is the obedience that Jesus points to here? He says he has been given a charge to keep from his Father. That is, he has an assignment, he has a responsibility, and that is to lay down his life and to take it up again. This text is actually a very important one, for if we let Jesus' words have their proper weight, this text will actually dispel a number of common myths and misunderstandings. So notice first what Jesus says, this charge was given to me by my Father. Now, there are some people out there who really hate the idea that God the Father was in any way behind what happened at the cross. And they have a variety of reasons for why they hate this doctrine so much, and we won't get into them now. But I just want us to see how Jesus himself would answer those people. Look at how Jesus frames it in this text. This is why my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again, this charge I have received from my Father. So the Father was pleased that the Son came to lay down his life and take it up again. And Jesus says, this was the charge, this was the assignment I received from my Father to do this very thing. And as we've seen again and again through John, Jesus keeps on saying that he was sent by his Father. That he has come to do his Father's will. And central to all of this, of course, was the cross. Acts 4, 28, hear the prayer of the church. They pray, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, and I quote Psalm 2, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And they apply Psalm 2. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so we're looking at this question, did the Father plan the cross? Notice what the church says. The Jews enviously plotting the murder of Christ, bringing forth their false witnesses, stirring up a bloodthirsty mob, calling then for his execution. Herod, Pontius Pilate, unjust civil magistrates who were uh, willing to condemn an innocent man for the sake of expediency and pragmatism. Or the Romans carrying out an unjust sentence. All these people conspiring to execute Christ, and it was all, verse 28, exactly as God's hand and God's plan had predestined to take place. Scripture answers so clearly, this was the plan of God. This was the purpose of the Father. And so that all raises the question, why? Why would God the Father plan 
the cross? Why would he send his son to die? Well, to answer this question, you can turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, starting, I think, in verse 4. I didn't write it down. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep had gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? So what is the reason for the cross? Why did God the Father send Jesus to die? We see the answer from this text. He came to bear our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sin, our wrongdoing. God the Father laid our iniquity on him, our sin, our guilt on Christ, so that he was stricken for the transgression of God's people. So we see this concept clearly of atonement. This idea of propitiation, a wrath bearer, an atoning sacrifice. Jesus Christ taking our place and receiving in himself the penalty that we deserved. You can think of the entire Old Testament sacrificial system as a big object lesson. Right? God showing his people what they truly deserved for their sin. And the blood of the temple, at the temple, was constantly flowing as animals were sacrificed every day. So this idea of atonement, this idea of Christ bearing our sins, taking the penalty for our sins, we see is not a medieval invention, as some authors claim. This was not a new idea created at the Reformation. This is the plain teaching of Scripture. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Christ's death on the cross was for the salvation of his people. God is just. God is righteous. We had sinned against God and we owed a debt, an insurmountable debt. Scripture tells us the wages of sin, that which we justly owe, what we have rightly earned for our sin, is death. Romans 6.23 So those who scoff at the idea of God requiring that atonement be made have no idea of who God really is. They do not understand his holiness. They do not understand his worth, his dignity, his value. They do not understand justice. Consider with me for a moment, who is God? What do the scriptures reveal to us about God? He is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. He is seated above the cherubim, enthroned above the cherubim. The sinless, heavenly creatures that are in his presence, the seraphim, the burning ones, shield their eyes as they cry out in his presence, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, verse 3. 
by virtue of who he is, perfectly holy, perfectly worthy and deserving, by virtue of the fact that he is the one who gave to us life, breath, and everything, by virtue of the fact that we are his creatures and he is our creator, we owe him our allegiance. We owe him our worship, our service, and our praise, our devotion, and gratitude. And I don't think we will ever in this life come even close to knowing how heinous it is for a creature from the dirt to spit upon the worth of his creator. (laughs) To scorn the worth of God. To go our own way. So once you've begun to come to terms with who God is and who we are and the distance that is in between, then hell will begin to make sense. The cross will begin to make sense. For if you have a small view of God, you will have a small view of sin. And if you have a small view of sin, then God the Son becoming a man and dying on a bloody cross will be utter foolishness to you. Hell will seem like a gross overreaction, right? An unjust, exaggerated, and ridiculously out of proportion penalty for something that you don't think is that big of a deal. But when you come to see God as he has revealed himself, once you come to see a glimpse of who he truly is in all of his glory and all of his holiness, then what will become stunning to you is not that God would pour out his wrath against sin. What will become stunning is that God has shown grace to sinners. What becomes mind-blowing is that this God, who is of purer eyes than to even look upon evil, Habakkuk 1.13, that this God in his great love set that love upon creatures like us. This is why Jesus came to die. This is why it pleased the Father that the Son came to lay down his life. Because this was the way that he would purchase the salvation of his people. Dying on the cross in their place. Taking the penalty that they deserved for their sin. Drinking that cup of wrath down to its bitter dregs. He shed his blood that we could be forgiven. For this reason the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Now, the next objection that is addressed by this passage goes like this. They say, well, that's cosmic child abuse, right? That God would take his son and would offer him in the place of other sinners turns God into a divine child abuser. Now, just saying those words leaves a bad taste in my mouth. So that is blasphemous. Um, But this is legitimately one of the views that's out there. And so let's see how the scriptures would answer it. Look at how Jesus would answer the objection, verse 18. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus is not a helpless victim being forced into something against his will. He is instead the epitome of heroic self-sacrifice. He is the ultimate and perfect expression of what it is to be a true hero, voluntarily laying down his life for others, taking responsibility for sins he had not committed. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. This is not the helpless victim being cast into the volcano. This is the heroic soldier who stays behind and sacrifices himself so his fellow soldiers can make it to safety. This is the soldier jumping on the grenade to save his squadron. 
greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. This is God the Son having been given a people in eternity past and agreeing voluntarily to come. To live the life they needed to live. To die in their place to rescue them from the power and penalty of sin. To rise again to a place of exaltation and receive his blood-bought people as his reward. Christ is not a victim of a cosmic tragedy sacrificed unwillingly at the hands of a bloodthirsty God. He is instead the ultimate champion, the archetypal hero, the perfect expression of courage, valor, bravery, and love. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus knew he would die. He came for this purpose. But we see as well that his death was not an end in itself. It was an expression of love because it was part of the means that God had planned to save his people. But we see as well in this text, the resurrection was not an afterthought. As he says, I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Now, given the central role that the death of Christ plays in our redemption, it can be surprisingly easy to forget about the resurrection. I think it was one of my professors who said that when you're preaching the gospel, make sure you don't leave Jesus in the tomb. If you look at the sermons and acts or the summaries of the gospel in the New Testament epistles, you'll see the resurrection is core to all of their gospel preaching. And it is central as well in the gospels, as we see in this text, in verse 17, where Jesus says, he lays down his life that he may take it up again. D.A. Carson argues that the last clause should probably be read as a purpose clause. Right? Jesus lays down his life uh, so that he may take it up again, in order to take it up again. Christ rose from the dead showing that death was defeated. Death no longer had any mastery over him. And we see as well that this is central to the promise of the gospel, for the promise is made that all who turn to Christ in repentance and faith, those who are united to him, will be raised from the dead just as he was raised. Romans 8 verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. We see Christ described as the first fruits from the dead or as the firstborn from the dead. Well, calling him the first fruits would be nonsensical if there wasn't a greater harvest yet to come. And he wouldn't be the first fruits, he'd be the entire harvest. And so it implies that there is a greater resurrection harvest coming. Calling him the firstborn implies that there are more brothers and sisters. Christ's resurrection is the harbinger of the death of death. It is the decisive turning point in human history as the curse is conquered by the head of a new humanity. Because he lives, we too shall live. Now let's finish up our text. We see the response of the Jews here in verse 19. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now C.S. Lewis is famous for popularizing what's called the trilemma. Uh, the argument he makes about the person of Christ trying to show that there are really only a few possible options about who Christ could be, right, given the nature of his claims. He argues that Christ must either be Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. Now Lewis is famous for this, but the more I read John, the more I think that Lewis was just repeating the same points that John has made multiple times through his gospel. 
Notice how, how John keeps on showing how Jesus' words and actions force this issue. Who is this man? Just to this point in John, he has already claimed to have the same authority as God the Father. He has claimed that God will entrust him to be the judge of all on the last day, John 5, 22. He has declared that he came down from heaven, John 6, 33. He has referenced the divine name Yahweh and applied it to himself, claiming not only pre-existence, but self-existence. As he says, before Abraham was, I am. Ego I me. And to this point in John's gospel, we have seen Jesus perform many signs. He has turned water into wine. He has done many unnamed signs in Jerusalem, John 2. He has healed a boy from a distance with just a word, saying, go, your son will live. He has multiplied bread and fish to feed thousands. He has walked on water, and most recently now in John, he has healed a man born blind. And so the question keeps coming up, who is this man? What options do we have? How do we account for everything that he has done and everything he has said? Well, as Lewis points out, it is really not possible for him to be just a good moral teacher, but not also be God. Given these kinds of claims he has made about himself, these are not the kinds of claims that you can be wrong about and still be somebody who is worth listening to. And the Jews seem to understand this. So then, who is he? There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many said, he, is a, he has a demon and is insane. Why? Listen to him, right? Lord, liar, or lunatic? Some of these Jews said, uh, how about liar and lunatic? Right? Having a demon and being insane. That would perhaps be a plausible explanation for someone who claimed to be God who was not. That's what they thought of Christ. That makes sense, right? Somebody comes up to you on the street and claims to be God Almighty. You will not be surprised if the next thing they tell you is that they were abducted by aliens last week. Right? You cannot be wrong about a claim like this to say that I am God, I came down from heaven. You cannot be wrong about that and still be someone who should be taken seriously. As Lewis puts it, someone who would claim to be God when they are not is on the same level as the man who claims to be a poached egg. <laughs> this is not a man who has it all together if he's wrong about this claim. This is someone who is crazy, he is insane. Or the other option, if he claims to be God but is not, is that he's simply lying. That he is a charlatan, a deceiver, and a very, very evil one at that to claim such ultimate blasphemies for themselves. Now you have the additional problem with Christ of having to also account for all these miracles that he keeps performing. Right, there's clearly some power at work here. So how do we explain all of this? Well, some of the Jews point to insanity and demonic influence. Right? It's demonic power that he's using to perform all these miracles. It's only because he has lost his mind completely that he would make the kind of claims that he does. Verse 21. But others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Right? If you look at the accounts that we have in the scriptures of demon-oppressed people, what you see is people who are raving mad. Right? People running naked, living among the graveyards, terrifying the townspeople. Matthew 8, 28-34. You see people crying out and cutting themselves with stones bursting apart bonds when they have been bound and leaping upon the people who bound them. Mark 1, or 5, 1 to 5. We see people being made mute by demons, being cast into fire and water and rolling on the ground with seizures. You hear insanity and terror from the demon-possessed. What you don't get from them is the Sermon on the Mount. Amen? (laughs) 
What, what you don't get from them is the good shepherd dialogue or the bread of life dialogue. And so the people recognize this. These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Right? Jesus speaks with such profound wisdom that has resonated through the centuries and confounded and baffled the absolute experts in the law, the scholars of his day. Right? Jesus basically went into the seminaries and baffled all the best professors they had. Right? This is not somebody who is oppressed by a demon. These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Jesus spoke with such authority that the crowds hung on his every word. Jesus teaches the scriptures. He explains the heart of the law of God. Listen to his message. He promotes godliness, self-sacrifice, humility, turn the other cheek, right? Study his teachings and see for yourselves. These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. We see as well that it's not just the words, but the works of Christ that present a problem for this theory. As the people ask, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Right, so not only are these not the words of a demon, clearly in the minds of these people in the crowd, these less critical members of the crowd, these are also not the works of a demon. Now from their rhetorical question, we can see that their view is that it is beyond what a demon could perform to open the eyes of the blind. We see this as a common question that people have been facing throughout John's gospel. They keep getting confronted with this again and again. How do we account for this? Can a man who is a sinner open the eyes of the blind? Would God listen to a sinner, to a false teacher, and give him such miracle-working power? And all the way back in chapter 3, Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Demons cannot do these kinds of miracles. People oppressed by demons do not have this sort of wisdom. And so he is clearly not mad. And he is clearly not demon-possessed. What options are left to us? That he is who he said he was. Right. Nobody denies that Jesus was a real person. And so we are all confronted with this question who is this man? Right. How do you account for him? What do you believe about Jesus? Now, when Jesus had first cleansed the temple, he was asked, what sign do you show for doing these things? Right. Basically, prove to us that you have the authority that you've just claimed by overriding the, the priests and cleansing out the temple. Give us a sign. Jesus answered them, John 2, verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. You want a sign? You want a miracle? You want something that would validate my authority? Kill me, and in three days I will rise from the dead. How's that for a sign? No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my father. A sign communicates something. It points to something. John tells us what Jesus' signs were all about. John 20, verse 31. These are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. God the Father has testified to the true identity of his Son. Jesus Christ has completed the work of redemption and offers forgiveness to all who will come to him in repentance and faith. The resurrection was then the final validation of everything Christ had claimed. 
He is who he said he was. He is not a liar. He is not a lunatic. He is not demon-possessed. And he is not simply a good moral teacher who happened to be wrong. He is God the Son. He died and rose again to purchase salvation for his people. Come to Christ and live. Amen.